Okay, so uh, welcome back. Hope you managed to get a bit of a break um, over lunch uh, and have had a chance to uh, try out the uh, exercises um, in the workbook. So I know a few of you got stuck on some of these things, so I'm just going to go through um, some of the logic behind this. It, it's probably uh, a little easier than you anticipated, so I'm just going to make sure co-host, I keep forgetting to do that, don't I? Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, you, you maybe in some cases you're just overthinking. I think uh, from the ones that I've seen, even if you didn't get it right, you're, you're very close. Um, so you're on the right lines. Um, so uh, don't be too, too disheartened. There's, uh, there's quite a lot of new stuff that you're picking up in these sessions. So uh, 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 yeah, don't worry, you're, 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 you're getting there. Um, so the first task was to write a program that asked the user to name their five favorite things. Uh, in the world in descending order and stores them in the list, removes the last two and prints up the top three to the user. Now there's different ways you could do this. The way I've done it here um, is uh, I've got a message that I print out first saying, please enter your top five favorite things in descending order. Sorry, can you make sure you're uh, muted there? Um, and then I've got a list uh, that I've called list of favorite things which I just, I've just stored, uh, created it as an empty list to start with. Uh, and then in my version, I've gone, I go through a for loop uh, five times um, and uh, I get the user to, on each iteration of that for loop, I get them to input a favorite thing, which is stored as a favorite thing, as a string. And it then appends that a favorite thing that's been input to the list of favorite things. So by the end of this, we've got a list uh, of length five um, that uh, of their favorite things. Um, and then I want to remove the last two. And again, there's different ways you could do this. Um, the way I've just done it here though, uh, just quite simply, so remember we said that um, the pop function removes the last um, entry of the list. So if I just call that twice, it'll remove the last entry and then remove the uh, last entry from that short list. So you'll end up with um, the top three. But there are different ways in which you could do that. Uh, and then I simply get it to print the top uh, three favorite things uh, by using another for loop here. Uh, and I just iterate through the loop. So I say for thing in list of favorite things. So for, it'll iterate through each of the elements in this, in this new list and it'll just print whatever they've put. So for the second task, I um, ask you to um, input 10 numbers, uh, get the user to input 10 numbers, which is stored in a list, and then using a single line of code uh, to create and print a new list uh, that contains only numbers that are both odd and uh, less than 100. So this is just to get you to use uh, list comprehension. Uh, so first of all, I set up a new list called list of numbers. Uh, it starts off empty. Uh, then I use a for loop again uh, to go around 10 times um, and ask the user to input a number in exactly the same way I did for task one. Um, and I, for each number, I then append that to my list of numbers. So then we've got a list of 10 numbers by the time we've gone through this for loop. Uh, and then uh, I've, I mean, some of you may have done this as um, the list comprehension on one line and then the print statement on the other, that's fine. Um, uh, but if you have done it literally all on one line, uh, you can do this, uh, which is to put the uh, print statement around the whole thing, around the um, list comprehension as well. And uh, what we're saying here is, so I've called it num. Again, it could be anything. It's whatever you're referring to each of these elements. So I've said num for num in list of numbers, if num is less than 100 and num modulus two is strictly equal to one. So let's break that down. So in our new list, what we want is uh, numbers for each number that's in my list of numbers, the 10 that the user has input, but only if the number, each number is less than 100 and that the, uh, the number is odd. That is to say that if you uh, take the number and uh, apply uh, uh, modulus two to it, then you should have a remainder of one because if you've got an odd number, so if you've got the number three, um, and uh, how many times does two go into three? Well, it goes in uh, once and you've got a remainder of one. You'll always have a remainder of one for an odd number. So that way we're saying, give me numbers for each number in the list of numbers, but only where the number is less than 100 and the number uh, is odd. Um, so it, 
that's quite a good demonstration actually of, of how useful list comprehension can be because you could do that uh, all at using loops but um, it will get much more fiddly and, and actually being able to do all of that in one uh, in one line of code is really useful uh, as well as being computationally efficient so it's, it's it's a good thing to get your head around list comprehension it's one of my favorite things actually about Python um, uh, is list comprehension it's, uh, once you get into the hang of it um, but essentially, if in, you, you always follow this format of give me whatever for the things in that list over there, um, and then optionally uh, if these conditions are met. And then uh, for task three, which uh, well done to Jenna, for, who was anyone that picked up on uh, the the explicit reference. I clearly, don't have any lost fans uh, in this room. Um, but I asked you to uh, you crash on a mysterious island, and you've you found these uh, numbers and names on the uh, on the written on the wall, um, and it's basically to get you to uh, write a piece of code that when you input the number, um, it will give you the associated surname, or if the surname doesn't exist it will tell you so or if they type the user types minus one then they'll exit the system so here i set up my um list of candidates uh sorry dictionary of candidates um and so i have for each one an index which is the number and uh separated by colon and then the uh, value so four uh, corresponding to chalk eight allen 15 monks etc etc uh and then Within an infinite loop, so this is a, an example of a deliberate infinite loop like we were talking about earlier, uh, and I give you the clue that this it might be a, a, a time that you may want to use uh, an infinite loop. Um, so while true gives us a, a deliberate infinite loop. Um, select a candidate, so we're going to grab, uh, ask the user to input a candidate number, um, and we're going to store that number in selected candidate. Then we use conditional logic here to see what the users input and do different things depending on what they did. So um, first of all, we want to check if the number corresponds to one that's in um, our dictionary. So we can, remember we can use the in keyword to do that. So I can say if uh, select a candidate, whatever the user's input in candidates, so if that number is in there, then uh, print the uh, candidates dictionary entry for that selected candidate. So we use the square bracket notation uh, to give the index value. Um, if it's not there, maybe the user has selected minus one, which is um, the uh, code we want them to use to exit. If that's the case, then we'll just print a little goodbye message and then we'll use break. So it'll break out of the, the while loop um, and then effectively it will end the program. Um, if none of those things are true, then basically what that means is they haven't input a number which corresponds to one of the candidates, but they also haven't input minus one. They've put in something else. So in which case, uh, they will just print a message saying no such candidate. And because we haven't broken, uh, broken out the loop, then we'll just go back around the loop again. It'll ask them to input another candidate number. Any questions about any of that? No? Okay. Um, as with all of these things, I'd recommend after the session, um, come back to it uh, in a day or so, have a look back through the notes, have a look through the solutions, I'll put up the solutions as well, and make sure that you're comfortable with how everything's working, um, so that you've got a good, uh, a good understanding. With, with any stuff like this, practice makes perfect. Keep practicing um, uh, these skills, keep trying things out, write your own little programs based on uh, versions of what we've, uh, what we've shown you as well. That's going to be important all the way through uh, the, uh, the training. Now, um, one of the things that I mentioned right at the start of uh, today's session was um, that Python was excellent uh, for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons uh, was that it's got very uh, strong libraries um, that we can import into our code so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. Now libraries are essentially um, collections of uh, functions and objects, and I won't go too much into objects at this point, um, that have been written by other people. So bits of code that have been written by, by others, but which contain useful uh, bits of code so we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, that we can, you know, we don't have to specify, for example, um, how to take the square root of something somebody's already done that and there's a square root function and we don't have to write that out manually every time we want to get the computer to calculate a square root 
Um, so to use these libraries, all we need to do is import them uh, into our program. And we typically write the import statements at the very start of our program uh, because we, we're going to need them throughout. Um, and we simply write that using the import keywords so at the very top of our code, we import the libraries that we need. Now you could, uh, strictly speaking, import everything. Uh, never ever do that. There, there is so much out there. Um, it would it would uh, <laughs> it would uh, completely uh, um, make your program extremely inefficient and take a very long time to import all this stuff. You basically import stuff as you need it, and sometimes you'll import an entire library, and sometimes you know you only need one thing from a particular uh, library. And as, as the course goes on, you'll see how you can uh, just import one particular thing. So you don't even have to import everything. You just think, I need the square root function or whatever it may be. I'll, I'll just import that. So here are two um, common libraries that you'll you'll use uh, a lot. Uh, one is called Math. Um, which imports the, the mathematics library and another called random, which imports the random library. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the random library now because the random library is particularly useful uh, for what we're teaching you to do. Uh, the random library essentially contains um, a, a lot of functions that allow us to generate random numbers. Now that's really useful because um, if we're going to build stochastic models, and remember when we talked last week about the importance of capturing variability, uh, we said we, we, when we're developing models, we tend to uh, include that variability by using distributions, uh, probability distributions, so that we can randomly sample from a distribution uh, so that when a patient comes into the ED, if we're modeling an ED, for example, um, we can uh, randomly sample how long they'll spend with the triage nurse, how long until the next patient comes in, uh, etc. So that's really important. So we need some way to, to get randomness uh, and to sample from distributions and other random elements uh, within uh, a model. Um, so uh, remember, just as a, a recap, distributions uh, are essentially our way of being able to, within a model, capture that natural variability that we see. Um, it, essentially, a, very, um, a distribution uh, specifies the probability of some value occurring um, uh, in the future and in our model. So it might tell us, for example, that 30% of patients in the past have spent six minutes with a triage nurse, um, and we can then set up our model such that when a patient comes in, uh, there's a 30% chance that the, uh, the amount of time that they uh, are sampled as spending with a triage nurse is six minutes. Um, and there's lots and lots of main distributions and you're trying to essentially fit your real world data as best you can uh, to ideally one of these um, named distributions. Uh, and so um, this little cheat sheet uh, slide, um, these certainly aren't uh, by any means all of the named distributions, but they, these are some key ones you'll use, particularly uh, exponential and log normal distributions you will use a lot um, uh, during modeling. So let's have a look at some of the random library uh, functions. And remember uh, that when we're um, uh, calling functions from uh, um, uh, classes or, or uh, objects that we've imported, we use the dot, note, uh, dot notation. So here, we, if we import random, then much in the same way as if we want to access uh, list functions by giving the name of the list, followed by a dot, followed by the name of the function. Uh, here, if we import the random library, then we would refer to random dot and then the name of the function uh, that we want to use. Uh, so uh, there's, and there's loads of functions that you will use in the random library. Um, but here are a few to sort of get you started. Um, so the first one is also called random. So you would use, uh, by, use this function by saying random dot random, that is the random uh, uh, method of the, the random class. Um, and this will basically generate a random number between zero and one that's sampled from a uniform distribution. So you remember, we talked last week about the uniform distribution being a particular distribution where the value, the probability of any value within a range being um, selected is equal. So there's an equal chance of any of the values uh, coming up. Now that can be really useful when you need to, for example, let's say, um, you want to uh, put into your model that 30% of patients go off to the ambulatory care unit. 
Well, for each patient that comes in, you can then sample a random number between zero and one. Uh, and if it falls within the first uh, 0.3, uh, of your of your sample. So if the number is between 0 and 0 0.3, you can say, well, that's 30% of all the values you could have picked, and therefore we'll make it happen if that's the random number that's picked. So it's really useful for being able to do those um, things around conditional logic where you're basically uh, essentially throwing a, a many-sided coin and saying, right, what's going what's gonna to happen? Um, and uh, based on a certain probability. Another really useful function is uh, randint, um, and as you may guess from the name, what that does is it generates a, a random integer, whole number, um, between uh, one value and another. So if I were to say random.randint 1 and 10, uh, then it will randomly generate a number between 1 and 10. Now you remember how only a couple of hours ago I said uh, that uh, uh, when you're dealing with ranges uh, in your for loops, for example, uh, that uh, it's always uh, from the lowest value and up to but not including the upper limit value. Uh, but I did also casually mention there are exceptions to this. Welcome to the first exception. So in randint, if you put 1 and 10 as your input, it will randomly generate a whole number between 1 and 10 inclusive. So it will include 10, just to confuse you there. Um, so uh, it's uh, one just to uh, just to remember. There are a few examples like that um, where it does include the upper limit. Uh, let's imagine as well we wanted to randomly select something from a list. So let's say I had a my list and I filled that with three names: Dan, Mike, and Kerry. Um, and I wanted to choose a random uh, name from that list. Then I can use uh, the random dot choice uh, function to do that. Uh, and all I need to do is say random.choice and then pass in to that function the name of the list from which I wanted to choose. So in this case, my list. And that will then randomly select one of these list items. Okay, so we've got a way there to select a random number between 0 and 1. Uh, a way to select a random whole number uh, between uh, a lower and upper bound. And a way to select randomly an item from a list. And those are by no means um, uh, all of the functions. There's loads and loads of functions in the random library, but they are ones that you will you will use quite commonly just for really simple stuff. Uh, so it's worth having those in your back pocket. Okay, it's time for an exercise. Uh, this is my favourite exercise, I think, of the day. Uh, so um, the exercise is titled "Are You Smarter Than Dan as a Four-Year-Old?" So uh, you remember last week I talked uh, extensively about uh, how I learned to program when I was four on my little Atari 800 XL with 64 kilobytes of RAM. Um, and one of the very first programs I wrote in uh, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code uh, was this. Uh, I wrote a program, a little game, uh, where the computer randomly picks a whole number uh, between one and 100 and the user's got 10 chances uh, to guess the number that the computer's thinking of. Now, every time the user uh, guesses a correct number, they're told either that the number is too low, too high, or correct. And if the user uses up all 10 chances uh, without guessing correctly, uh, then they're told uh, you lose and uh, the game would end. So uh, your, what I want you to do is to not only do this, you're, you're going to write that program that I wrote back when I was four in BASIC on my little Atari. You're going to do that in Python, but you're going to do it even better. You're going to prove that you're smarter than four-year-old Dan. So I want you to write that with the following extras that I didn't get a chance to implement back in the day. I also want you to um, uh, have a score so that when the player is playing this game, they have a score which starts at 1,000 uh, and which reduces by 100 for every unsuccessful guess and which is displayed if the user wins. So if they get it right first time, if the computer thinks of a number and then the user gets, uh, gets it right bang on, they get 1,000 points. That's the maximum they can have. But if they get it wrong, then it goes down by 100 each time they get it wrong until obviously it gets down to uh, zero because they only get 10 guesses. I also want you to implement that the user's guesses that they make are stored in a list and once the game is over, whether they've won or not, the user's guesses are printed out uh, so they can see the guesses that they made. 
I also want you to get the game to ask if the player wants to play again after every game ends. And obviously, if they do want to play again, then the program should continue and they should uh, go back to the beginning. The computer should think of another number, their score should reset, etc. And then also, after each game, the player's score is checked against a current high score, which defaults to zero. So that's the lowest score you can get. The high score starts off at zero. If the last score is higher than the recorded high score, then this replaces um, the high score. Uh, and so then that new high score is stored. And then if they play again, then that, uh, that score is the high score to beat. And if you manage to do all of that, and you really want to fly with this, knock yourself out, do whatever you like, add lots of bells and whistles, and declare that you are indeed smarter than Dan as a four-year-old. So um, that's your task. Uh, I'm going to give you 45 minutes um, to do that. You are also very welcome uh, to work in small groups if you would prefer. So if you want to work within your peer support groups or even groups within that, that's absolutely fine. Don't feel as though you have to struggle on your own. Um, but uh, either way, even if you are working individually, um, then make sure that you're you're chatting with your groups. But it might be nice to sort of um, to, to group up to have a think about this. So uh, 45 minutes to do that. Create your very first computer game in Python. Any questions about any of that? No? Brilliant. Okay. Well, I'll so say if you need any help, then do shout. Um, you have been shown everything you need to do this. So there's nothing uh, that, uh, that we haven't shown you yet. Um, uh, that you need in order to be able to write this program. So think about what you've learned so far today um, and look back for your notes um, and have a go and break down the problem, break that down. Um, I would probably recommend to start, maybe start with the version I created when I was four years old as your starter. So do that, the simple version without all the bells and whistles and then gradually build up um, these extra bits from that. That might be a good way to start. Okay, great. Uh, so what time is it now? We've got 22. Uh, how long does it say? 45 minutes. So if we come back at 25 past three, does that work for people? Great. See you shortly. <laughs>